Hello and welcome to another episode of Script Apart. My name is Al Horner and this is a podcast about the first draft secrets of great movies and TV shows. Each episode we're joined by a brilliant screenwriter as they discuss their first draft of what became a beloved movie or series. On today's show we're joined by the wonderful Ted Griffin, the screenwriter behind a heist extravaganza that for fans of dazzling set pieces, A-lister casts and Brad Pitt inexplicably eating snacks in every single scene was truly like hitting the jackpot, if you'll excuse the bad pun. Ocean's Eleven, based on the 1960 Rat Pack vehicle of the same name, starred George Clooney, Julia Roberts, Matt Damon and just about every other adored actor from that era, all operating with their charisma and star wattage dialed all the way up to Eleven. It told the story of Danny Ocean, a fresh out of prison con man played by Clooney, who's plotting a robbery like no other. His plan is to raid the vaults of the three biggest casinos in Vegas, with $150 million on the line, as well as something far more important to Danny, the affections of Tess, his ex-wife played by Roberts. The film was directed by the great Steven Soderbergh, who alongside Ted pulled off the kind of lucrative score that Danny Ocean would be proud of. The movie grossed $450 million worldwide, launching a franchise and wowing critics in the process. In the conversation you're about to hear, Ted tells me all about how he approached its charming, clockwork intricate screenplay. We talk about capturing the seedy side of Vegas on the page, why it was important to find an emotional heartbeat for the film that meant it wasn't just money motivating these characters, and what it was like to spend six weeks in one of America's craziest cities with the then biggest stars on the planet making this thing. Spoiler, pretty crazy is the answer there. Before we dive in, can I just say a quick thank you to our supporters on Patreon for helping make this episode possible. If you're not yet a member of that community but would like to be, head to patreon.com forward slash script apart to find out more. We really do appreciate your support. Okay, that's all the admin out of the way. Let's get into it, shall we? This is the incredible Ted Griffin discussing the first draft secrets of Ocean's Eleven, a movie that is pure serotonin as far as I'm concerned. I really do love this film. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. You're listening to Script Apart, hosted by me, Al Horner, produced as ever by Camille Demek. Ted, so great to have you with us. How are you doing today? I'm doing uh, fabulous, overheated, but otherwise uh, no complaints. Congratulations. Ocean's Eleven recently turned 20. I don't know where those two decades have gone. It is a perfect movie and I will fight anyone who says otherwise. I may say otherwise. So we'll <laughs> just the cuffs. What, what is your relationship with the movie today? Like, it, as I say, it has been 20 years. Does it enter your thoughts often, either because of its enduring place in our pop culture or because of any cherished memories you have of working on it? How often do you think about this movie? On occasion, if I died today, I reconciled to the fact that parenthetically, it would be the first credit that would follow my name. Like, if there is no bit, that's what it says. And it's nice. Uh, occasionally, I'll get a text from a friend saying that they just showed their kid Ocean's Eleven. And there's some gratification in that because it was the intent in writing it was to please me when I was a kid and watch The Great Escape or Magnum Seven or sort of movies of that uh, of that ilk. That was the kind of movie I wanted to make. And now it feels like it's that kind of movie that maybe parents will show their kids and because it's fun and not shitty. <laughs> that's, that's yeah, that's my that's my motto. Fun, but not shitty. They should have put that on the poster. Yeah. Uh, that would have, that would have increased the porn box office, uh, but no, I, I'm, I'm, I go to no, uh, fan conventions or, uh, I, I don't think there are any, it was a fun year, 20 plus years ago, uh, spending six weeks living in the Bellagio, making it. I realized it was like two, I wrote it in 1999. As I said before, there was, well, the internet was born, but before, um, you know, I was still printing scripts out and messengering, messengering them to the studio. It was, uh, it, it feels like a, a universe ago. What do you think it was about the film that struck such a chord? Uh, you know, c certainly uh, the unique combination of talents involved at that moment was pretty loud. That there hadn't been a a combination of stars like that in a while. It's a little more commonplace now. I think that type of movie hadn't been done on that level 
in a while. And it's a genre that one done well is really exciting. I mean, it's tough to say otherwise because the, the movie was it wasn't groundbreaking. It wasn't revolutionary in the genre. I think it was, if anything, maybe like the quintessence of that genre. It took a little bit of Seven Samurai, a little bit of Top Copy. But, you know, it really helped to have that all that um, that Klieg like uh, Klieg light of movie stars uh, on us uh, to sort of um, break through the field. Yeah, as you say, nowadays we are used to seeing posters for movies with that number of stars all kind of sharing the same billing with the MCU and things yeah. like that. But but Oceans, it, it was a new thing. One thing that's so curious to me is that typically when I interview people who've worked on remakes or legacy sequels, the first thing they want to do or feel obliged to do is to kind of evangelize the original, like the source material that they're adding to or updating. So often you'll hear platitudes about staying true to the magic of the first movie because they have, you know, they, they hold that film in such reverence. In your case, though, am I right in thinking you weren't actually much of a fan of the original Oceans? Have I got that right, Ted? That's right. In fact, I grew up a pretty serious movie buff. I was watching lots of old movies very young. So I was seeing The Great Escape and Magnum 7 and, and The Professionals at a, at a young age. But Ocean's Eleven slipped by. And there's a reason for that, I think, which I'll get to. I didn't actually see it until it was offered to me. And I was, this is uh, late 1998. So I'm 20 seven. And uh, I watched it. And I just thought this is a, not a good movie. This is a great credit sequence and a kind of an interesting artifact of the time of watching the Rat Pack. But as a movie, it's it's no good. As a consequence, I passed, I think, a couple of times on it. And they had had uh, Warner Brothers and Jerry Weintraub, who was producing, had developed a script already, which was sent to me, which was reasonably faithful to the original movie in that it was about vets, guys who had been in, I think, Iraq together, who thought, hey, we can use our skills to heist uh, a Las Vegas casino and get rich and all the characters knew each other already. And so it was sort of like assembling the old friends. And there was one that was, you know, a little bit more patterned after the Sinatra character and the Dean Martin character. And there was a, uh, I, I, I can't say there was a dancing garbage man, but there was definitely <laughs> each one was a Dino Sammy spot. And I think the movie, The Rat Pack with Ray Liotta and Don Cheadle and Joe Mantegna had already come out. And I, while a big fan of the music, wasn't sort of a fan of their genre of movie making and for, for like um, I could go down the rabbit hole of talking about Sinatra's movie star. But I think that kind of there's a certain laziness to their movies. So we're just going to show up and people are going to love us. So I didn't like the movie at all. I've since, by the way, become friendly this is a huge name drop, sorry, become friendly with Martin Scorsese, who kind of a, has a major affection for the original Ocean's Eleven. And the credit sequence of Casino is sort of a nod to the credit sequence of um, Ocean's. And I think he has never seen the remake for a couple of reasons, but one of which is he doesn't want it sort of his memory of the original <laughs> um, uh, disturbed. Uh, and so I never, I, I never bring up Ocean's Eleven around him and I never, and I certainly don't besmirch the original. That said, I did pass a couple of times, but then it struck me because I think it's generally a bad idea to remake a good movie. Uh, when I got Ocean's, I thought, oh, this is actually the right idea to do a remake of because it's kind of a, fun concept of uh, a group movie and the heist Vegas, because who can't root for that in a way? You really have to come up with a, motive, a strong motivation for robbing anybody else. But Vegas is sort of like is asking for it. And so as I was thinking about it, I passed twice. But then uh, there was a guy named Chris Buchanan who worked for Jerry Weintraub. And I mentioned his name because he got totally thrown under the bus by Jerry, who's dead. So I can say these things. Uh, Chris <laughs> was the guy who really lured me into doing the movie. And then Jerry fired him or, you know, let him go shortly thereafter. So there's a reference to Chris in the movie. There's a character named Bucky Buchanan, who's a gambler who gets hauled away when he recognizes Saul. And that was my nod to Chris for doing a good job and then getting absolutely no credit for it. <laughs> so Chris had called me and said, give this some more thought. and. My memory's a little vague here, but I remember driving around, I think, L.A., and I either had the soundtrack to Touch of Evil on, which is that Mancini 
score, which if I could sing, I would sing for you right now. <laughs> or the main title from The Taking of Pelham 1, 2, 3 by David Shire, either which are sort of really kind of cool, vibey, great opening titles for, for movies. And I started just, in a way, it's, um, my instinct for Ocean's Eleven started with that feeling of, oh, this could be cool. Like, or that uh, that kind of feeling for a movie that you can't quite articulate, or at least Tarantino could probably articulate it at length, but you're just going to like, uh, you're going to a movie. Great. And so I, I called Chris back and I said, okay, let's like have a meeting about this. And I met with Jerry Weintraub, who was a pretty phenomenal character. And basically I had very little, I just sort of threw a bunch of shit up against the wall, but I said, I think I have the, you know, a sense for the movie. I took the job. I will tell you for all uh, for reasons that I have since learned were all wrong reasons uh, that I sh I should never have done it. The reason I did it was I had just had two movies. My first two movies were made in 98 and one had been a very happy set that turned into a, just a terrible movie, which I was embarrassed by and <laughs> maybe stopped writing for six months. <laughs> and the other one was like a horrific set, which actually kind of, with a fire director and just and everything that could go badly went badly. And it kind of turned out to be a pretty good movie or a movie that has, I, I'll, I'll say, I guess I get a lot more, as many reactions to this movie today as Oceans, though it's, it made less than $2 million. So the reality is nobody's really seen this movie called Ravenous. Yeah. Um, I won't say what the terrible movie is. Best laid plans. <laughs> The point is, is that I was sort of like flat on my back of like, oh, I, I don't know, like I got to take a job before these movies come out and fail. And I was a little down on Hollywood. And so I just thought, OK, I should take a job and this is a job and it's probably going to be a well paying job. And I have no idea what the story is yet, but great. But I'll, I'll leap in, which every time I've done that otherwise has been a colossal error. So I leapt in. I said, OK, I'll figure this out as I go. And I started talking a lot with my brother, Nick, with whom I've also written some scripts since Matchstick Men and some sort of script doctoring on other uh, scripts. And uh, because we grew up watching movies together and sort of the, the notion of, all right, forget about army vets like the friends getting together to do this because that kind of takes away a big part of the fun is meeting these guys and seeing these guys sort of come together. The seven samurai aspect of the movie or the Magnum seven part of it. Nick and I both grew up as enormous fans of the sting. Like that was comfort food home from school, put on the sting. I think we uh, naturally gravitated towards the, like the, the professionals version of the movie guys who do this for a living, which are, the movies I've already recited, The Professionals, too, uh, if I didn't mention that with Burt Lancaster and Lee Marvin, uh, simply because there's sort of f fun in seeing uh, guys who live by a kind of code or live by a professional ethic going about and doing that. And that sort of begat the the reason for the heist, which is pretty critical in a heist movie of like, OK, why are they doing this? Because if it's just for profit, then you have a certain kind of heist movie like Thief which is not as lovable in a sense. It's not, not a knock on the movie. It's just sort of like the sting works and, or is, is more uh, emotional because it's revenge for Luther. Even Thomas Crown Affair is sort of like, I get it because he's like, this is what it makes him feel alive. And for Ocean's Eleven is like, this is what these guys do. And then individually, they all have sort of their own reasons for doing it. Uh, the Malloy brothers for the thrill, Basher Tar to, to work with professionals again, uh, and Danny's doing it, of course, to sort of prove his love for Tess, which isn't revealed till about halfway through. I can't believe I've talked this long. All right. So <laughs> the point being is, is that was sort of like the ideation of, all right, forget about the original movies, characters and like everything but 11 guys heist Vegas. It got changed then into really without clearing it with anybody, studio or Jerry Weintraub, I may have told Chris, but just started working on that aspect of it. Of, of uh, So we meet Danny and he starts uh, sort of selecting his crew that way. And I think I wrote um, like 40 pages of that and gave it to Chris Buchanan just to say, hey, this is just a proof of <laughs> proof of life here. There's there's I'm, I'm doing some work. <laughs> sure. And a guy who worked with Chris who I won't name, snuck it off his desk and read it and went to Jerry and said, 
uh, you got to read this. Griffin's gone off the reservation. And I don't know if Jerry read it or not. Uh, he wasn't a big reader, but he called me into it, called me for a meeting and he said, and here's my Jerry Weintraub impression. He said, you, this is terrible. You like, this is the wrong thing. <laughs> yeah, these guys, they're not friends. They're supposed to be friends. Danny's getting out of prison at the beginning. He's a loser. You can't, you can't do this. You got to start over. And uh, I said, okay, Jerry. And I, at that point, I think I'd already snuck those pages to uh, the studio executive who said to me, just don't listen to Jerry, just keep going. Um, So, you know, those first 40 pages are the first 40 minutes of the movie. There is sort of an omerta rule in the Hollywood of like, don't talk too much about how the sausage gets made. I'm going to share some of those, you know, maybe a couple about Jerry because he he can't he can't defend himself anymore. Um, And I'm just that small a guy. (laughs) I can't remember what the first question was, but that was the sort of how things kicked off. There's some other little details. There was another director attached at first, but he went away over time. He's since been canceled. So let's leave that aside um (laughs) and i do remember like taking uh, uh, an important trip to las vegas with chris buchanan and like with the taking a pelham 123 soundtrack like on whatever i had then (laughs) like cd walkman i don't know yeah 99 Uh, i guess it would have been maybe i just i carried my my uh uh my stereo my uh, record player with me maybe it was that long but I remember walking around Vegas, like listening to music, like, oh, this is like suits. Cool. Awesome. And that was a lot of sort of little boy fun for like it, I, I could tell my 14 year old self was like, dude, good job. Good job taking this one. <laughs> um, all right. I'm going to take a drink of coffee. You talk. <laughs> that was an amazing effort. So when you, having decided you were going to be brave enough to kind of like throw the rule book out the window in terms of what had come before, what were the sort of non-negotiables that you knew this movie needed to justify the Ocean's Eleven title? Obviously, it kind of had to be an ensemble piece. It had to have a certain star wattage to kind of be true to the Rat Pack movie. Vegas feels like it was a crucial backdrop, a character in its own right, to use that cliche. What were the other kind of elements of the original that you knew, okay, I can throw out everything else, but these elements have to be in there or it's no longer Ocean's Eleven? I mean, pretty much you name them, meaning Eleven is part of the title. You got to justify Eleven characters in there. And it's so associated with Vegas that it's you're not going to move it from there. And I knew that it should be a movie that contained movie stars the way Magnum Seven did, Great Escape. Danny and Rusty were con- and Linus were constructed as, okay, let's get... I'm not sure if I ever saw like Clooney and Pitt, that teaming, but I saw somebody like Clooney or... <laughs> Was, would have been right at that. Am I right thinking Jeff Goldblum was someone? Who- uh, he was. He was somebody. Uh, like there was a list of Rusties, kind of like the 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 second star, which was uh, at the time like Goldblum, uh, Kevin Spacey. I'm trying to think of other people who were like who were very good actors who could be like the second guy yeah. to. I'm trying to think about other examples in movies. So I originally c- kind of conceived Rusty as being uh, that sort of actor. And that's why Brad Pitt was a huge promotion. I mean, I would say, argue at that moment that Brad Pitt was a bigger movie star than George by a hair. And yeah, so it yeah. was interesting. Uh, it was a coup to sort of get him, but it was it. It, it turned it more into a two-hander than, let's say, Magnificent Seven. Magnificent Seven is Yul Brynner and Steve McQueen, even though st- at the moment, Steve McQueen is since, you know, in hindsight, is a much bigger movie star. At the time, he was in support of Yul Brynner. So that was one conception. And Linus was conceived as being like whoever was going to be the next young guy. Uh, I can't remember who was that age then. But so, um, and the irony is, is that I think... When I turned the script in, and this is, sorry, uh, a while ago, some memories, a little uh, hazy. And then also the studio, you're, you're, you're not in all meetings or especially as a writer, you're almost in no <laughs> meetings. At yeah. this point. They say, thank you very much. And I do know that they offered the movie before they offered it to, to Soderbergh and Clooney. They offered it to Matt and Ben, who were coming off of Goodwill a couple of years before, but were major stars. And I think... 
from what I'd heard, what I've heard is that Ben was game and Matt said, no, we can't be these guys yet. Like yeah. we're too young. They were uh, not even 30. And so they, they passed. And then uh, the irony is that then they came around to offering Matt a role that he was arguably too old for at that point. <laughs> and then Linus should be like in his early twenties and Matt at this point was 30, 31. So, so those were the three roles that were sort of built for stars. There were a couple, two roles uh, in Saul and in Ruben that I thought, okay, here are great sort of character roles that we can get a spectacular actor for. And we did, in fact, I wrote uh, Saul for Alan Arkin. And we cast him and we had a table read with Alan Ark and the whole uh, the whole cast. Julia wasn't there. And so I read her lines and I think, you know, found some layers to test that she may have missed. <laughs> I'm joking. For those listening at home, I'm smiling. Um, anyway, Alan Arkin did gave one performance of Saul, which was so outstanding and so hysterical and terrific and everything I dreamed of. And then the next day I had a physical and there was a, he had a health scare that he had to go and deal with and he couldn't be in the movie, which thankfully 20 years ago, he's continuing to do just, just fine. So, but that's, that's how uh, Carl Reiner uh, came to replace him. So anyway, back to your original question of what else did I need to sort of keep in the movie? Uh, it was, uh, and I don't think just my by my design, but I think a communal idea of this was not going to be a violent, uh, edgy movie. This was um, a caper and fun. And therefore, it, it had to like the sting. Uh, it had to get resolved by nonviolence through 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 brain, not brawn. And I remember investigating when we went to Las Vegas, I, I, we got a bit of a tour of the, how things worked uh, back a house and, you know, there's a count room and then guys with a lot of weapons escort the money to a bank, tr uh, to a truck. I, I thought, okay, let's, how to make it more difficult of not just, because if you were going to break into an actual casino and rob the count room, that would mean lots of guns, like the face masks, you'd be doing something uh, in the tradition of heat instead of the tradition of top copy or the sting or another movie that was a big influence. And I left there are a couple of fingerprints in the movie, which is the Michael Crichton uh, great train robbery, which I think is something named something else in Britain, like the first great train robbery or something, which I think is a very well-structured movie. And there's a scene where you see Donald Sutherland, pickpocket somebody and then sean connery comes up to him and says nice pull I, i'm this is from memory which is damon when we meet damon and he pickpockets the guy and then clooney pickpockets him and it says nice pull that's sort of like a hat tip um to michael crichton uh and that and that bit once again i've forgotten what i'm talking about <laughs> uh anyway so it was the ambition of the movie it was to be okay let's be clever not violent no guns. I think it was also probably in the tradition of the first movie, something that was, how do I say this? Other than like champagne entertainment, meaning it's a little bit of the fantasy of Las Vegas as opposed to the reality. Meaning when I think people watch the Rat Pack uh, bop around Vegas and seem like, oh, that's what it's, that's what it can be. And therefore let's make this movie like, Everyone, the extras in the casino are all dressed nicely. If you go to Vegas, it's you're going to find a whole lot more T-shirts, and it's, it's not going to be the sexy crowd, the background uh, players that that you get in the movie. So there was there was certainly it was like we're going to be in a, a slightly more movieish universe than a reality universe. What was your relationship with Vegas? Which Vegas did you want to put on the screen? Because as you say, like this film does kind of offer up a really distinct fantasy of that strange little place in the desert. Like it, it captures the glamour of it, but also a certain seediness and sense of adventure and Americana. How did you go about conjuring it for the screen? It's a weird town. It's a town that I th as a man, you have a different relationship to. And I, it, I can't speak it as a, a, a as a woman what your relationship to uh to vegas is over different uh ages but i remember going there when i was a preteen 
where you go for because they're water slides or it's sort or you're going to circus circus. This is the 80s, so it's probably a different attraction now. But I do remember from that era seeing all these flyers for hookers, which aren't really around anymore. But that's where the flyers for hookers idea came from. Was it was a childhood memory of, of uh, when you're realizing that sex is out there and you go, oh, wow, there's this the promise of prostitution <laughs> was, was somehow in the air at 14. And then in, in your 20s, it's it's the you know bachelor party destination. Yeah. And it uh, and it really becomes increasingly what I'd call a 23 hour town, which is uh, at the 23 third hour, you have to get out of there because <laughs> it, it's, you know, you've been awake too long. And if you stay 48 hours, you're going to be a wreck as you get older. Then it's sort of like, Oh, great. We'll go. Maybe we'll see a show. There's some, like there are a couple of nice restaurants there and, uh, and maybe play a little golf, like how you approach the city changes as you, as you get older. So I was, I guess, writing this movie, uh, as sort of in the oh, I'm kind of done with this in the in my 20s. So the notion of of saying yeah that element the strip clubs and the the hook, flyers for hookers that's there. But let's try to have the adult fun of Vegas. And I remember talking to somebody who was saying oh here's what here's what you should do with that movie. You should like cast all the guys who, you know, like go to Vegas and like Jeremy Piven and Nick Cage and Vince Vaughn and sort of like, and I just sort of thought, yeah, that's exactly the wrong vibe. I want, like, I want for this of like the guys who are going to be dating strippers. I don't want in this movie. I want it to be a little bit more innocent uh, of that. I think what Casino Scorsese's movie had come out four years before. So he'd already sort of made the point of the Disneyfication uh, Vegas so I didn't feel like that needed to be like it needed to be a point. Terry Benedict is really based on Steve Wynn, who was really the king of Vegas at that moment. And there are a couple of references in the movie. I, I think when he says something about um, I'll be sorely disappointed if you try to buy a sports car in Long Beach. Uh, I, I, there's some line late in the movie that it is a direct reference to somebody, I think, kidnapped a uh, uh, Steve Wynn's child or something, and they pay, he paid the ransom, but a note immediately turned up in a dealership in Southern California, and they caught the guy. I think, uh, <laughs> and it was, and, and and there were a couple of moments. I think it maybe in the script that got lost that because Steve Wynn had uh, reportedly a remarkable eye for detail, even though he was fighting blindness, he has he has terrible eyesight trouble, which I believe is public information. But he would walking through the lobby of the Mirage notice if there was a bulb out somewhere and he like, and he would say, like change that. And I think there were a couple of moments for Terry Benedict, which may have not made the cut um, where you see he's got everything under control. Obviously, as we discussed, like Vegas was integral to the story you set out to tell. Another thing that the title demanded was 11 characters. And if it didn't, I mean, well, no sane person would choose to populate a film with that many characters. Otherwise, if the film didn't kind of promise it in the title, it's so many characters to kind of have to conjure like a meaningful arc for a motivation for to, you know, finding a distinct personality for so many characters is like a real screenwriting challenge. Then of course, you've got to track all of these people throughout the story and give them things to do. So they're not just hanging around the movie kind of accomplishes that so well. I'd really be curious to know like how you went about mapping out so many different characters and making them memorable. I remember how we started. I mean, it was, I was very conscious of, okay, we have to distinguish each of these guys and their shorthands of doing that. First, take two of them and make them one character, the Malloy brothers, yeah. like, which is, you know, a little bit born out of, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Slapshot, but the Hanson brothers and that they're they're three brothers who are very funny in that movie. Uh, the casting, it was as I was writing, I thought, oh, well, they'll probably get offered to Owen and Luke Wilson. And I think it did. And they were doing Tenenbaums uh, and were not available. There was a brief discussion of offering that to the Cohen brothers to make their yeah, acting debut. That's right. <laughs> and I think they said, yeah, we're not, we don't really feel like being out in front. So that was one. Uh, another uh, easy way of distinguishing character is make him um, mute, or in this case, Chinese. That saves you a lot of worry about giving him lines. You you, you give him things to do and that distinguishes him. Uh, and then there's demarking things by age, 
Saul, nationality, basher. Yeah. Like the tough one was Livingston Dell, who I think had a different name at some point. And I think that was just sort of a make him uh, anxious, like give him like give uh, a definition. And then when we cast Eddie Jemison, that sort of was easier to write to. Uh, I always knew that Frank Hatton was going to be probably like a comic actor or going to somebody like Bernie Mac. I'm trying to remember if I had a template for him from another movie or something. Linus was the young guy. And um, have I left somebody out? Uh, I think that's everyone in that. Well, obviously, <laughs> it's George and Brad, but you had the Rat right. Pack characters um, to kind of model those on. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you, you do. Um, George is the idea man. Brad uh implements them but they're they're the manager and the uh and his co-pilot to mix metaphors and then and then the <laughs> thing is like okay what do all of them do what's their thing their talent and then there's that game of of, of sort of designing the heist so that each of them <laughs> has something to ha have their moments and then i think there was a uh, i had some design of like okay i'm going to give them each an exit point so that as the heist goes on, I think like Frank was the first, uh, d does his job first by sort of helping Linus get to the back of the house and stealing uh, Terry Benedict's code. As each of them sort of left the heist, I gave them, a, OK, they're out there. So we don't have to think about them anymore, which is also sort of a sleight of hand. So you thought, oh, they're gone. So when they're actually they all come back in as SWAT members. Spoiler alert, Gavin. <laughs> uh, and we'll, uh, I'll talk about that scene in a moment. Another Dre Weintraub story. Uh, so there was a good deal of just like plumbing, which is something that is occasionally very underrated in screenwriting because it's difficult work. And when it is done well, it seems like it's easy, but uh, it's like Die Hard is an extraordinary movie in the plumbing and how everything is arranged and it doesn't get enough credit because it's because <laughs> a movie without plumbing that just has, you know, emotional monologues seems like better writing. It can be extraordinarily difficult to do to the degree that it seems like, well, of course that's like that, that just fell into place. Mm. And it also really helps because I remember starting to write this, I had had at some point, I think before the movie was brought to me, I had had the notion of, oh, what if there was a, a hostage situation where the money was taken hostage, where somebody just like said, I'm going to blow up this money unless this happens. And then so when this uh, job came around, I thought, oh, maybe I can use that here if I can like take half the money hostage in order that they can get away with half the other half the money. Like that's an interesting idea. And of course, that's sort of the fake clever idea where you think, oh, that's I guess that's their gimmick. That's what they're going to do. So I came in with that and I and I sort of thought, yeah, I like that idea, but that's not really going to be the knockout idea that I need to the twist, which let's say like the sting of Newman and Redford shooting each other. That's the unexpected thing. And of course, the feds who we think are forcing Redford to do this are all are also in on the con. And and maybe inspired a little bit of that. I sort of thought, oh, that's when the notion came to me one day over lunch of like a SWAT. They'd call in the SWAT team, but the SWAT team's bullshit. And then the, at that point, I thought, OK, I know what my ending is for the highest. If I can build everything up to that, uh, I'm good. There are some plumbing elements, which I think in hindsight could be stronger. I think we maybe we got away with it like Clooney being pulled into the back room to get the kick, shit kicked out of him it was, you know, an excuse to get him into the heist and not on the sidelines. It's a little far fetched <laughs> that he would then make that move. And then as somebody pointed out, and I didn't realize this until after the movie was made, somebody uh, had the question of, oh, well, how did they get, they get all the flyers for the hookers into the vault? to blow them up. And I thought, I don't have a, or, or to put into the bags. And I thought, I don't have a clue, but I don't <laughs> like, hopefully uh, since I didn't think of it at, for six months after we shot the movie, since that's not really vital, it's sort of like a, it's a finger to Terry Benedict in a way. Were there other kind of ideas you explored before landing on the story that you ended up telling Ted? And um, by the time you wrote your first draft, had you worked out what this film needed to be? And was that first draft then pretty close to the finished movie? I would say the big thing in the first draft was I knew there needed to be a sequence halfway through the movie 
that gave the audience like a little bit of fun. The movie is structured in the first act or first third really is uh, gathering the team. And then there's this sort of obligatory act of like preparation. Now, during preparation, which can be a very dull, methodical uh, sequence, uh, you bring in some new element or some sort of twist there. And I'm trying to think of what's true in a, in a different movie. But in this, it's like the introduction of Tess. Yeah. It's like, oh, we were going to heist a casino. Now we're getting back at the guy who stole your wife. What's up with that? And we have now we have sort of a love story to sort of spice things up in during the the preparation sequence. I think because it was a the sort of movie it is, I needed to just give them a little bit something more in the middle of the movie. So the idea of oh we're gonna there's a complication of Basher's plan to take out the power has been screwed up. So we need to uh, steal the pinch. So I thought okay mini heist to as a sort of an appetizer before we get to the meal of the main heist. And I think I wrote something and this was, I was writing for Warner brothers at the time, which was this incredibly kind of masculine action oriented studio, the studio of lethal weapon and the matrix and Joel silver. And so I sort of stupidly thought, uh, you know, I'll do something Bigish here that's good for the trailer and will please them. <laughs> and so I wrote this uh, sequence where they go to steal the pinch, only they're realizing that someone else is going to steal it, like terrorists. And this is pre 9 11. So, like at the time, it was still like, oh, that can be fun. And so I wrote this sequence, which is that I, I'm hesitant to say because it sounds so off the grid for this movie and it is but that the, the terrorists have somehow stolen this thing and they have it in a car and they put the car on one of those big trailers that have two levels of cars yeah and they're driving it and so it became this kind of car heist in which like the guys have to get onto the car get the car the thing out of the, i can't remember what it was how it was accomplished but it was just an extraordinarily expensive five to ten minute sequence of action uh, that I thought would appeal to the powers that be. And I wrote that and I turned it in and nobody liked it. Then I kind of threw that out and I did the, a version of what's in the movie now of like basically heisting Caltech, which is a, a university I, I grew up across the street from where I thought, okay, they would have something like this. And I didn't really have a good idea for the, that heist that would make it especially fun so i went the other way and decided oh this this will be funny because it'll be linus getting stuck in there and so that was i think in the first draft something that was uniquely different there are some a couple of scenes that i think got that were sort of as people say shoe leather like just unnecessary that got snipped but structurally i would say that was kind of it i can't remember i think in the first draft Maybe George uh, Danny didn't get sent back to prison. Um, I can't remember. The, I, I think there was an ongoing figuring out of what the coda of the movie should be, which I feel is still the weak point of the movie. I feel like we didn't stick the landing there. But then, and then when Steve and Soderbergh got involved, we spent a good deal of time sort of honing some of the dialogue. He had a few ideas for different scenes of introductions, which we tried, which didn't really work out. And so we went back to what was there. Can you remember any of those, Ted? I think there was a, he wanted to introduce the Malloy brothers with them, like driving go-karts, like getting into a <laughs> shape on go-karts. And I sort of thought, okay, that can be fun. But what we are introducing here is the ability for them to use kind of remote control and like we're actually seeding in something that is going to be part of the movie without people realizing it. And the go-karts doesn't accomplish that. I think there were a couple of times he, he had ideas which I thought were may, were very funny, but maybe we're introducing the characters humorously, but not in a there's, a, there's a, a tone that you have to find that's like, OK, this is fun, but these people are actually competent. These guys could be funny in how they were behaving with each other or uh, 
but they had to be cognizant of when they were funny as opposed to being jokes, if that makes sense. M- meaning they, they couldn't be the joke. They, they could be amusing. <laughs> yeah, that's a really important distinction. And we see that in each of the introductions. Like every time we meet one of these characters, what they're doing kind of ladders up to their expertise and they can be funny within the framework of what they're doing and in their personality. But the competence is never pulled into question. Like we meet Rusty teaching cards to movie stars. We meet Basher with Rusty posing as a cop. There's obviously a yeah. the moment with Linus in the middle of pickpocketing someone on a train. And in those moments, you also kind of allude to these histories with each other that um, makes the world feel really lived in. So yeah, that's another really interesting part of the film. But, but to kind of go through things or to pick up some scenes kind of chronologically in the script, the film begins with Danny Ocean, played of course by George Clooney, and it begins at his parole hearing. On the first page, you've got the parole board member going, Mr. Ocean, what we're trying to find out is, was there a reason you chose to commit this crime or was there a reason why you simply got caught this time? Danny says, my wife left me. I was upset. I got into a self-destructive pattern. Another board member asks, if released, is it likely you would fall back into a similar pattern? And Danny shoots back. She already left me once. I don't think she'll do it again just for kicks. At the earliest point here, you're sort of seeding the emotional heartbeat of the film, which is Danny's relationship with Tess. There's also the irony of him receiving divorce papers as he's granted parole, becoming a free man in more ways than one. How did you land on this being kind of one of the driving forces of the movie? As you mentioned, it's kind of a a reveal kind of about halfway into the movie. It's Danny's motivation. I'd love to hear from you, Ted, about like why this movie needed that element, why it couldn't have just been a story about like a guy who wanted to get rich. You know, there, there is something about setups and payoffs because in, in those opening lines, yes, we're, we're hearing exactly what sort of is critical to Danny Ocean, but because it's at the beginning and because it's sort of relayed with a little bit of, self-deprecating jokiness it doesn't really seem like oh here's a guy who's like his mission is to get his wife back but there is something about screenwriting where it's sort of like pare it down to just what the thing's about my regret about this movie and i think it's a little bit there but it should be there more there's not the moment where julia realizes or we have the oh this is why you did this i mean there's a there's kind of there but it's not it, it's not really wasn't it present enough in all of our minds that, oh, Danny has just sort of ripped off the Bellagio as a act of love for Julia. They end up together. It's all great. But I feel like, oh, we could have had our a little bit more emotion to this movie than simply the Gossamer ride that it is. I can't remember what your original question is, but <laughs> that's, that's just something that came to mind. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's I feel like. And maybe that was, frankly my youth in writing it. I was really gearing it to the 14 year old and then not putting on my slightly more mature cap of, I want to have a little something more at the end of the day. I'll ask you a different question, Ted, about these early scenes and kind of how we're setting up Danny for the rest of the movie. He is a criminal. He's coming out of jail. We're meeting him at his parole hearing. His criminality in the film is kind of framed as almost Robin Hood-esque. Like, you know, he's not stealing from the rich and giving to the poor, but he's certainly kind of taking on the establishment. There's a moment later in the film where Danny tells Rusty that he does what he does because the house always wins. There's kind of an underdog story that you're setting up here in the framing. Was there any pushback from the studio about making ostensibly the protagonist a criminal? From the studio, no. uh, That initial meeting with Jerry Weintraub saying he he didn't actually even mind that that he was a criminal because frankly, you know, that's baked in. They're going to heist Vegas. They're even in the original, there are civilians who are going to do a criminal act. So, in fact, making them kind of career criminals is somewhat an improvement of their, <laughs> of their character. I think about them a little bit of the, this is the equivalent of putting on a, a show. Uh, hence, there's this curtain call in front of the fountains in which they put on this big show that lifted the money. Their criminal act was a magic trick as opposed to anything violent or really harm didn't come to anybody. Yeah. And I think that's sort of uh, I think runs for all the characters is they do this not for love of money, but for love of 
the show or, or um, it's, it's why we make movies or why we play baseball or why uh, ho- hopefully, hopefully if you're lucky, why you do anything is yeah. for the bliss and the money will follow. And I think that's, you know, very much in Carl Reiner's face at the end of that. He felt, he feels like, Oh, he, he gave the performance of his life and now he can retire, but it is always easier if you're, if you have characters who kind of, are doing it something out of love as opposed to just money. There is also, I suppose, like, again, this is a bit of a tangent, but like there is something that overtakes you as a viewer and can overtake your sense of morality. Just seeing kind of competent people be competent and outsmart their circumstances, like everything from Breaking Bad to, well, like the movies you just mentioned, you don't necessarily have to kind of agree with what these characters are doing but the way they're having to improvise around these challenges coming their way is just inherently cinematic and inherently interesting to watch. And speaking of improvisation, in Oceans, I think it's like page 38, page 39, around that mark where that heist genre staple of someone setting out the plan and us kind of getting a glimpse of how it should go. Now, of course, the genre demands that things aren't going to go to plan. And instead, these characters are going to have to think on their feet and be quick about it. And Mm -hmm. that leads us to some really interesting places in this movie. And um, one of the most interesting parts is is this idea of the pinch. I'm fascinated with where that idea came from and the degree to which like that and some of the other things that we encounter in this movie when we really get into that act two, act three kind of meat of the heist, how much of it's grounded in reality? All right. So in the original movie, they knock out the power for a hot second, I think they knock out a power line outside of Vegas, if, if I remember correctly. Yeah. And I think in the script that Warners had developed before me, the pinch, the electromagnetic pulse may have come from there. That may be one thing I thought, okay, that's a useful MacGuffin. You know, it's not, I'm not using that term totally correctly, but you get it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so I, that may have been born out of that, though. I know a friend of mine also had was writing a script that had because I think this was a real thing that knocked out power. So I thought that sort of was the linchpin of the um, of the highest of having that happen. You know, it, it's also a spectacle. Throwing the lights out on Vegas is sort of a a moment. Yeah, yeah. Um, doing it in the middle of a prize fight is having all that is is a bit of excitement it's also uh, i I think in in similar to the design of the heist of like okay we kind of know what's got to happen up to a certain point what the what the plan is and then we can see the plan get screwed up or improvisation to that and then at some point the magic trick for the audience is is uh if we don't know what the plan is, then we're watching something and we're thinking like, oh, is this going right or going wrong? The sting in a sense is this way because we don't know what their whole design is. We think, oh, this is going terribly wrong. And in fact, it's going totally to plan. Similarly here with the SWAT team and everything is sort of like, oh, this is trouble, but actually it's it's the deal. So when you set up and not just nice movies, but if you but if you do say, OK, this is what's going to happen, then you're making a promise of like, OK, this is that now you're going to watch how that doesn't happen or how they have to screw that up. As yeah. opposed to if you say we need to do this and then you don't hear the plan, then it's sort of like, all right, we're figuring out we're, we're sort of watching uh, and, and revealing how they figured it out. These movies, and this also goes to, I mean, this goes to Bond, this goes to a bunch of really good drama on television, whether it's Breaking Bad or or, or anything where you uh, sort of know, oh, well, I know pretty much my instinct is this guy is going to win because this is either a TV series and he's got to come back next week <laughs> or... It's this is this sort of movie, so I don't think Bond is gonna fuck up. But how? How is he gonna win? I mean, I was trying to. There, there was a an ambition to sort of vary all the things, so you have the fun of uh, based on people's abilities. Matt Damon has to be able to uh, to pick somebody's pocket, or else why have him? Why is he there? Yeah. So you got to you you set something up so that he can do that. I can't remember what the inspiration was for uh, Frank Catton, like his accusation of racism. I feel like there's a, probably a Richard Pryor movie that does something like that. So there's 
you know, a combination of technical know-how versus the, with theatrics, which is also Saul. And I remember, I think this was the, uh, one useful studio note was they wanted another complication. And it was one of those things that I, it was sort of an of course moment, which was that Yen gets his hand hurt during uh, mission to steal the pinch. And therefore, when he's got to make the leap in the heist, his, his wounded hand becomes a complication and almost throws everything off. So it's not simply A to B to C, mm. going back to the Kramer versus Kramer example of like, okay, how can you make things slightly more difficult? Not only are you stealing money from a casino, but now you've got to, got to do it one-handed. Uh, I'm trying to remember where the, because there, there was some part about the like the decoy vault and i can't remember what the inspiration came from that Uh, i remember shooting it we had to stop and i had to sort of walk through okay this video camera is live on the guards who have been knocked out that video camera is (laughs) there is pumping in something fake that they is pre-recorded and then getting to the logic of because i think there was one shot that Stephen lined up, which was Stephen and it was a uh, Brad and George in the elevator vault waiting to go in as the SWAT team. And I had to stop and say, no, George can't be there because he would have had to walk across that video field, which is live. <laughs> so he's got to be over there with the money with Matt. And um, and we'd like stop, you know, with a bunch of movie stars and SWAT <laughs> uniforms had to stop and say, <laughs> like just figure out all the things, which of course, hopefully you're not really conscious of as you're watching the movie. But if you do something wrong, then people start becoming like, uh, don't ever, as Billy Wilder said, don't ever bore and don't ever confuse. I would say 95% of everything in the movie is just made up to be, if it's a security thing, made up to seem like an obstacle and then made up so I can get around it. Um, (laughs) Because if I had gone with the reality, it would just be heat. The ending of this movie, you mentioned is something you are not entirely happy with. It sounds like there was quite a lot of debate as to how to wrap this story up and then what sort of coda it needed. Like unpack that for me. What are your frustrations, and and what were some of the motivations behind the way that you did end it? I like George going back to prison. Meaning, I don't think the movies where the guys get off scot free is sort of like almost the sting kind of works because Newman and Redford take no money because that's not what it's about. So, like George having to pay a price, or uh, uh, Danny, I should say, uh, makes a lot of sense to me. So there are a few versions of the scene written. I think with Brad picking him up a couple of times without Jul- uh, Tess, Julia being there and just trying to figure out, OK, can you end this with a sort of a, a feeling of, oh, you know, they're back together again and who knows what's going to happen next. We kind of did a, a lift from a movie called Two for the Road with Albert Finney and Audrey Hepburn, which ends. It's a running gag through that movie where he says bitch and she says bastard. And mm. it you end it with them saying that, but it's. Liar and thief. In that liar and thief. Mm. And I guess my hesitation with it is having the Terry Bennett sort of twin goons following them was sort of like this last minute of like, oh, they didn't really get away with it. Or uh, like, oh, here's this complication. It doesn't really send me out of the audience whistling. And I think, and it was Stephen's idea, and I I don't think anybody was necessarily in favor of it, but we just kind of like at that point, it was like, all right. And my regret about it is that I think I should have yes anded it. And having as those two guys begin to follow Danny and Rusty and Tess, that a little monster truck comes out and and makes this two goons like swerve off the road and crash. And you realize, oh, the Malloys were actually following them, uh, <laughs> meaning like get one more over as opposed to end it with this feeling of wah, wah, like, I don't know. Uh, I just don't, I, I don't like that last shot. That's my beef and I'm sticking to it and I'll fight you. <laughs> Let's go. Name and time and place. It did kind of set up the idea that this wasn't a story that was completely finished. There may be more story to tell. And of course that did happen. There were two sequels. I know that you did some uncredited work on the second one. There's of course also been a, an Ocean's 8, which was um, a sort of reboot with a, with an all-female cast. 
what's been your relationship with the sequels? Like it's, um, they've obviously been like tremendously successful in terms of the Soderbergh movies, especially. Did you enjoy watching them? I understand that you kind of walked away because you felt like you had kind of told that story and um, there were other stories for you to tell, Ted. Take me through it. Talking about the movie initially and getting going, talking to the studio, I said, I think this can be a franchise. And I think in my mind, this isn't a great franchise, but the Magnificent Seven franchise, you know, had a short run where Yul Brynner or the Chris character continued. And but but because, you know, characters died (laughs) during the the first movie that, that, you know, they, they would recruit there would be different a different seven guys or or new new blood into it anyway so but but it really never came up in conversation ever 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 while making the movie and i don't think i ever heard the word sequel during post and then afterwards when it opened and did well it started getting talked about and steven had this idea of doing it in europe and i sort of took some time and thought about it and i had one idea that i really liked that wasn't a whole idea it was actually more an idea for a trailer, which is you have George and Brad having an espresso in some square in Europe and saying conversation they have at Musso and Franks. And they're like, what, you think we need one more? And Brad puts up two fingers and uh, two more. And George says, who do you have in mind? And Brad points and you see crossing the square towards them, Paul Newman and Robert Redford. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's actually like it's the third teaming of Redford and Newman joining Clooney and Pitt. Yeah. And I thought, well, that's exciting. And then it's sort of like it doesn't have to be called Ocean's 12 without going to Indiana Jones Last Crusade. Both those guys are obviously could easily, easily be fathers to Clooney and Pitt. I mean, Pitt is sort of a in a way a, a copy of Redford and um, yeah. in, a, in a star persona and whether they were their mentors or what the relationship was. I just thought, who gives a shit? <laughs> like I'm ready to watch that movie. <laughs> I pitched that. Don't want to speak out of school. Someone involved in the movie had a very bad relationship with one of those two men and said, and it was sort of told to me like, nah, it's not going to work out. Mm. Like, they won't they won't work together. And, and at that point, I went uh, back to the drawing board and I had like a couple of notions of what could happen, not a whole movie. And I sort of thought there are good reasons for making a movie. And then there are sort of good reasons that come with it, like making money is a reason that should come with it, but it shouldn't be the reason for making it. Yeah. Yeah. My general rule of working on a movie is the money can be great and you can be working with somebody spectacular that you've always wanted to work with. But if there is not some sort of excitement about the story you're telling, you're going to get into trouble. And I've had to, I've taken the money and had to give it back because I realized I didn't care about the story and I've signed on to work with a great filmmaker and had to bow out and screw up the relationship because I realized that it wasn't the, the, the story wasn't there for me. And in this case, I thought I don't really have a story that I'm dying to tell and the money's good, but it's not like good night, everybody money. Um, <laughs> and so I just said, you know, I, and I got other stuff to do. So I went, Oh, I, I said, you might be able to find somebody with fresh legs and fresh ideas. And so I went away and at some point, uh, I came back to help out like on the weeks preceding filming on Ocean's 12. And I think there are some lines and I think maybe Rusty's introduction as a hotel manager. I feel like I there, there's sort of a rule. And I think in Hollywood, if you, if you don't have credit as a writer on a script, don't talk about it. Sort of fucking up here. But uh, it's not. I mean, it's Nol- Nolfi. George Nolfi wrote the script. And so it's. I uh, contributed very little. Uh, so, and at that point, I think I saw the mo- that movie once. Jerry Weintraub called me about 13 and I was very sort of done with it by that point. So, and I don't know if I ever actually saw 13. I didn't see eight. I mean, I know that they're uh, sort of seen as a trilogy on the other side of things. If you worked on Jaws, you probably don't see Jaws <laughs> 1, 2, and 3 as a trilogy. <laughs> probably um, not. not to say... By the way, I want to say real quick, Ocean's Eleven ain't Jaws. <laughs> it's, not, it's not on the same level. Yeah, my only gripe is that I didn't get any any money for any of the sequels. because They're using characters I arguably invented, but movies work different than TV. You don't get cash for that. I don't know if the guys who got 
of the estates of the original writers in 1960, how they got reimbursed. Mm. Um, but I, I think they keep credit or based upon characters created by those guys. It's the Writers Guild is a curious organization. When we talk about good reasons that go with making a film, getting to spend time, six weeks, I believe, with some of the most famous people on earth in the most kind of circus-like city in America mm -hmm. making this movie, that's a pretty good reason. Like, how was your experience on set? What, what were some of the kind of like maddest experiences, presuming there were some, of being kind of on the ground while Oceans was being made? I can't imagine just practically how it works. Like this was Brad post Fight Club at the top of his fame, George at the top of his fame. Like, how was that whirlwind six weeks for you? Well, my liver got out alive, but just barely. Um, <laughs> It was, a, it was a good time. I mean, shooting a movie is is fun, but it's not vacation. And uh, there were there were several points to approach. First, because you started, George and Brad were very famous. They didn't hold a candle to Julia. Of course, yeah. It was a very interesting display of what star power was because we were in on the floor of Las Vegas which is you know open to america and you have all sorts of people and so i would be occasionally maybe talking to one of those two guys and somebody might come up and ask for an autograph or a picture and it was and it was nice and and matt was you know uh not unfamous too and matt i noticed guys wanted to be matt's friend mm. george and brad were famous like they're just like there was a different level they're kind of a different thing where it just guys just thought related to Matt in a different level of like, this, this guy's my buddy. When Julia came to town, cause she was there just two weeks. It was like the Beatles. Uh, it was, uh, you just like people went fuck. Uh, and, and there were tourists who were, who were like almost screaming. It was a different level of fame. That was sort of fascinating to watch. It sort of ruined Las Vegas for me because when you go into that place with movie stars and money and you have sort of the run of the casino so that you're you're by association of VIP and there were a couple of big parties that were thrown and they were a lot of fun. But there were also a couple of nights that, oh, made some calls and we've opened up this restaurant so that you guys can go like hang out there. and. <laughs> That doesn't happen for me now when I go back to Vegas. I don't say, hey, can I, can I have the bar to myself? Of course, Mr. Griffin. Yeah. Uh, I had a, a, a pass that I could sort of go back to and see how things worked. It was because um, I, I think I went back there like a year later to the, and went to the Bellagio. And I thought maybe somebody will recognize me or when my check in, they'll see my name and I'll get an upgrade nothing uh and, and uh, has, has never happened we went back to the same old vegas there are also some fun stuff of like i think meryl streep said hollywood is like high school with money and this was sort of the epitome of that in good and bad ways in that they're they're social stratas and that your movie stars are like your cool kids star athletes and then they're sort of stratospheres around that being the writer on set is always a little bit like being the freshman that nobody wanted to invite, but who will write, <laughs> write your papers for you. Yeah. And whenever you're, when you're ever just the writer on set, it can be extraordinarily boring except for that moment where somebody actually needs you and you kind of feel good and you feel patted on the head. Uh, but then they'd rather not have you around again. One thing I'll say is that because of the dynamic of having five or six fairly powerful movie stars, it kept all egos in check. And not to say that anybody would have been badly behaved otherwise, but it was like nobody was going to be a prima donna on that set because yeah. it would just it, it was going to look bad. Whatever else happened in Vegas can stay in Vegas. Um, it can stay there. Yeah, <laughs> Ted, I've had so so much fun chatting if, with you. If, penicil if penicillin didn't get it. Uh, <laughs> Stay there. <laughs> well, on, uh, on that wonderful note, thank you so much, Ted. It's been so much fun chatting with you about this movie. I absolutely adore it. Here's to the next 20 years of, of Oceans. Uh, good luck to you. And good luck to all the listeners, wherever you may be. You've been listening to Script Apart, hosted by me, Al Horner, produced by Camille Demek. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time. <laughs>